So hi everybody, thank you for coming. I'm Diane Hirschberg and I'm director of the UAA Center for Alaska Education Policy Research, which is a little center within ICER. And um, uh, I know some of you heard this, but just to repeat again, first of all, if you got this notice through ICER, but you would like to be on CAPER's mailing list, they are separate, although we do things together. So um, you can email me or you can simply join our Twitter and I will tweet at you. We don't spam people. It's just announcements of publications and talks and occasionally with tweets, other stuff of interest in education in Alaska. Um, if the big earthquake hits or the fire alarms go off, um, please, there's an uh, exit just past the elevators down there on the right, and that's the stairwell you want to run down. There's another one in the back if we really can't get that way, but that's the preferred one. And bathrooms are right around the corner. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Schott, who is a researcher um, that way, two streets over at South Central Foundation. And um, I'm really excited to have her give a talk today about her doctoral research looking at the role of subsistence and traditional activities and the well-being of Denina Athabascan youth and forward and back. Excellent. I should be able to remember that even. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Diane. And is it okay if I do this for oh. people to be able to see? Is that okay? It's great for me. Is it good for you guys? Okay, I recognize a few of you. I'm hoping to make some new friends today. It's nice to see some faces of people I don't know yet. So, look, I'll, um, and I have time after to stay and visit for a few minutes. I don't know if this room has, but if anybody has questions, I also have cards that I brought. Um, I actually did this research when I was a graduate student at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I had been living up here for, I don't know, I've been here for 11 years now, and I finished this a year ago. Um, so I had been, I did the research in 2008, 2009 um, and was building up to it until then. So um, I came up here to do the research and find a, find a home for the research, for, for myself really, and for and a topic for the research. And this is where I landed, was in uh, Denina country, inland Denina country. So some of this is going to be a little bit... Um, for those of you that know Alaska really well, as I'm assuming most of the people in this room probably do, um, some of it will be a little bit basic. Um, this is an elaboration of, at the beginning, when I described the research site, this is an elaboration of my dissertation defense that I gave for my professors in Ohio who are not as familiar with the research site and the geography and the, the cultural landscape. So, so I was in southwest Alaska, which um, most of you are probably familiar with this incredible map that Michael Kraus and his colleagues did. Um, but I was in Denina country, which um, is comprised of four different um, Denina or Denna groups in southwest Alaska. And I was in uh, inland Denina area. Um, while living there as a national park, actually, let's go back to the prettier picture for a second. While living there as a national park ranger and a graduate student, I visited several uh, Dena'ena, Sukpiak, and Yupik villages, including the Denina Athabascan village of Nundalton. And this project emerged from those visits, um, from my conversations with elders, and from my interest in doing health-related research with Alaska Native youth as a graduate student in medical anthropology, with an emphasis on the intersections between adolescence, well-being, and culture. So just to give you an idea sort of demographically of how um, getting a little bit more narrow in scope now, we've moved from southwest Alaska down to the, the level of the borough. Um, the Lake and Peninsula borough where the research took place is um, primarily Alaska Native. Um, it's a mixture of the Dena'ena and Yupik um, and some Sukpiak peoples. Um, and follows the composition really of the state when you go from urban to regional to village level or, or borough level in terms of major grouping. Getting a little more specific, um, non-Dalton or Nuvan Dalton, as it's um, called in the Denina language, is about 165 year round residents, but like a lot of villages, that number um, grows a lot in the summer. Um, it's about 190 miles southwest of Anchorage, and about 85% of the community is um, Denina. It's like a lot of uh, rural Alaska communities. 
um, very youthful. About 30% of the population is 18 or under. And like most of Alaska um, villages, it is also um, based on a, has a mixed subsistence based economy. Um, the lake that you see is Six Mile Lake. It lies at the southern tip of Lake Clark, which contains the northernmost sp uh, spawning grounds of the Bristol Bay sockeye salmon fishery, which has been in the news a lot lately. Um, for those with watershed interests, the progression from north to south is Lake Clark, Six Mile Lake, New Halen River, Lake Iliamna, Quijack River, and then Bristol Bay. Um, well, the community members have ancestral ties to the region going back um, farther than anyone knows, at least a thousand years that we know of, um, with the oldest uh, archaeologic site in, uh, largest I should say rather, archaeologic site in Alaska, the Quijack. Um, archaeological site um, that dates back about a thousand years. Residents have been in this particular location for um, since the 1940s. Um, in the early 1900s, people moved from Lake Clark down to Six Mile Lake um, due to uh, epidemic. And then in the 1940s, due to shifting patterns of the lake shore and the mudflats, they moved from what's now called Old Non-Dalton down to um, the current village site. So there's a lot of migration between the village and Anchorage um, for seasonal activities such as fishing, medical appointments, shopping, and family events. And um, about 97% of all Non-Dalton households use subsistence resources in the last fish and game subsistence harvest. Um, or I'm sorry, in the 2004 subsistence harvest, about 97% used subsistence um, resources. A more recent harvest, however, showed um, 354 pounds per capita, which is down from the 600 pounds in 2000, but still a substantial amount of meat um, and protein coming from subsistence. Okay, so I'm going to talk about subsistence a little bit in theory. And then we're going to move on to subsistence in the lives of the youths that I talked to um, and spent time with over the course of about a year. So anthropologists have long studied subsistence practices in northern peoples. Until fairly recently, however, most of this research theorized subsistence as a function of physical survival and focused on documenting the tools and techniques of hunting, fishing, and gathering societies. This constituted the salvage anthropology, some of you may be familiar with that lovely term, um, of Franz Boas and some of his colleagues in the, the early 20th century. Their primary interest uh, was in understanding the particularities of these societies through rigorous documentation of their material cultures and belief systems. The next paradigmatic generation of anthropologists to study subsistence in northern cultures um, observed an increasing globalization of economic systems and predicted that northern indigenous societies would be assimilated into larger and western cultures and that subsistence practices would go extinct. And they actually used those, those words, that language. They did not. For these anthropologists, subsistence was primarily an economic activity and one that would no longer need to be uh, practiced or um, would no longer would be needed once northern peoples were absorbed into the larger western cultures that were engulfing them in the search for natural resources and political dominance. Instead, northern societies did what human cultures have done for time immemorial. They adapted their practices and with them their politics. Most recently, northern anthropologists postulate that subsistence is a tool not just for economic survival, but for political discourse, for negotiation of power, and for the instantiation of contested and, yes, sometimes threatened identities. In other words, subsistence doesn't merely feed the physical body, as Boaz postulated, or drive the economic engines of society, as Chance suggested, and later came to understand was not, not the only engine that it drove, but it sustains and represents the emotional and cultural well-being of, native, of Alaska Native peoples that is necessary for not just surviving but thriving in the face of historical trauma and contemporary and ongoing threats to survival, such as high rates of suicide among Alaska Native youth, particularly young men. So that's subsistence in theory in a nutshell. Subsistence in practice in Dan'ana country includes activities of hunting and trapping, 
of small and large game, such as moose, bear, caribou, sheep, beaver, seen here on the drying rack, porcupine, grouse, and arctic hare, gathering of several kinds of berries, wild greens, mushrooms, and other plants. Wood is also collected and or used by most families to heat homes and steam baths. In fact, they used, thought it was funny that in the apartment that I had in the village that I only had a monitor heater and I didn't actually have a wood stove. And when they heard that I didn't have a wood stove at home in Wasilla where I was living at the time, they thought that was really funny and that I was really stupid because when the, when the power went out, I was going to be really cold and they weren't. Perhaps the most um, important dinna and a subsistence activity is fishing. In my early visits to Nondalton, elders shared concerns that youths were not taking up the cultural traditions that had sustained their people for generations. They feared that youths lack the engagement with these activities, especially with subsistence activities, and that this foreshadows a decline in both the individual and collective well-being of the Dena'ina people. I was particularly interested as an anthropologist of childhood and adolescence um, focused on health and well-being to know what the youths themselves would say about this and so that really was where this project um, found its roots is to begin to talk with youths um, and to find out exactly what they're thinking and feeling and what they're doing and what they would like to be doing in the future with regard to their cultural traditions. Okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail about what subsistence activities are, how much people are harvesting. I've given you, I've thrown some numbers at you and I've given you a brief overview. These are some great resources though for those of you who are very interested in subsistence. Um, both the, um, if you want to know more about Nondalton, um, a very detailed ethnography of the people of Nondalton that was written by a local resident, Andrew Baluda, in collaboration with a UAF um, Late, the late UAS anthropologist Linda Alana um, is a wonderful resource. You, they're out of print, but you can sometimes find them roaming around the internet, and I have extra copies because I was buying them up when I found them um, as I was doing the dissertation. I couldn't have enough of them. Um, and then the Department of Fish and Game has this wonderful website where you can go and look up their technical reports on subsistence from across the state. We have really a fabulous resource in our Fish and Game, our ADF and G subsistence um, division. They're the little known division of fish and game um, in the shadow of wildlife and, uh, and the, fishing, the fishing folks. Um, but they do a lot of really incredible ethnography and survey work. And I would recommend um, looking at their publications. So to give you a brief overview of, I said I was looking at the intersection of subsistence with childhood and child um, and, uh, and culture. So I'm not going to spend, there's a whole section in the dissertation where I talk about theories of childhood and adolescence mm -hmm. and how um, we as anthropologists have historically and today in my position where I come from in that tradition like to look at childhood and adolescence. This really sums it up and this is actually not even an anthropologist. This is, um, I think Barbara's an educator. Mm -hmm. um, she's an education at, policy at UCLA. At UCLA. Mm -hmm. Um, so Diane and I had fun discovering that and, and, and discovering her work really because she is doing some really amazing work. For those of you in the back, I'm going to um, do the thing you're not supposed to do and read right from the slide. Um, from a part but this really sums up kind of where I was coming from both um, empirically in terms of what I wanted to observe and look at and record but also philosophically and um, epistemologically. From a participation perspective, <coughs> We examine in closer focus the actual processes by which children participate with other people in cultural activity and the ways they transform their participation. The investigation of people's involvement in activities becomes the basis of our understanding of development rather than simply the surface that we try to get past. The central question becomes how people participate in sociocultural activity and how their participation changes from a relatively peripheral involvement, observing and carrying out secondary roles, to assuming various responsible roles in the management of activities, and I would add, and thereby becoming the leaders of their communities and of their cultures. So, what did I want to know? How am I doing on time, Diane? Oh, good. Okay. I want to make sure we leave time for conversation and questions. Um, 
So the research questions, how are contemporary Dena'ena youth engaging with subsistence and other Dena'ena cultural activities? How do they experience their well-being in and across multiple life domains? And then ultimately, what role does subsistence play in Dena'ena youth's well-being now and in the future, potentially, um, and the, at this double crossroads of sociocultural and personal change? So for my methods were mixed. I did participant observation over four seasons, um, and that included spending a lot of time in the summer at fish camp. Um, and it also included um, spending a lot of time at school. So um, fish camp, because I was interested in subsistence, school, because that's where kids spend an awful lot of their time. Um, and I went, they have a culture week. They have a lot of sports activities. I subbed in the school for a little while. Um, I went to community events, Slavic, Winter Carnival, NYO, family activities, you name it. Anything that, there, that I could do, I did. And when I wasn't out and about visiting with people or taking walks with kids, I was at my apartment, um, which was on a, one of the three main roads in Non-Dalton and was fortunately, very luckily, right across the road from a family with eight children, which happened to be kind of a locus of activity in the community for kids that would come over to play um, with all of those children. And so, and the kids all knew me from when I used to come as Ranger Jen, um, and they knew me pretty quickly after I got there as doing this research project. Um, and so I would frequently have anywhere from, I had a rule there had to be at least two kids, especially if they were little kids. Um, but that there would be anywhere from two to ten kids that would come into my little, um, what do you call it when it's just a one-room apartment? Efficiency, my little efficiency apartment. Um, and we'd play games, we'd talk, we'd do interviews. There was also a climbing tree right outside the, 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 um, the apartment. So it was pretty ideal location-wise. So in addition to just hanging out, which is every anthropologist, or at least this one's favorite thing to do, hanging out with people and le learning and listening, um, I also did several surveys and questionnaires. I did a multi-dimensional student life satisfaction survey that's developed by an anthropologist in South Carolina, um, Scott Huebner. Oh, there's an N missing in his name. That should be Huebner. Um, I did um, questionnaires on cultural heritage and identification, daily activities, how they spent their days throughout the year, um, values. Um, I, kids rated their, the personal importance to them of a long list of Athabascan values, their daily routines and activities, and their future aspirations to participate in specific activities like various subsistence activities as well as non-cultural um, activities. I also did a series, and this was kind of the, the really, um, well, it was all really important, but this was where a lot of the qualitative data came from, a series of semi-structured in-depth interviews with each child. These were developed using the, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the developmental assets from the Search Institute and Peter Benson's work. Um, he passed away, I think, last year or the year before. But I got to hear him speak in the 1990s and was really impressed with what he um, was doing at the Search Institute, looking not at what was wrong in children's lives and what wasn't going right, but what was actually contributing to things going well. Um, so over 300,000 youths, there are now many, many cross-national studies, um, but there were over 300,000 youths in the original study um, from grades 3 through 12 that were um, interviewed, surveyed, about their well-being, and that established support for these 40, what he called and copyrighted, developmental assets. And these are factors that, when they are present, have a direct positive correlation to educational outcomes and health outcomes and other, and other um, good outcomes, things that we want to see in um, children's lives. Um, so the, oh, and so this, publication, Helping Kids Succeed Alaskan Style, was commissioned by um, and published by the Alaska Association for School Boards Institute for Community Engagement. It's a mouthful. Um, they did a really wonderful project that I was not in Alaska yet for, um, where they went to many different Alaska communities and interviewed 
kids and elders and school teachers and parents and held talking circles and community focus groups and um, tried to figure out just how relevant are these 40 assets that have been shown across the rest of the United States to be directly empirically linked to childhood out good childhood outcomes. Um, how relevant are they? How appropriate are they for our communities? And they did some adjusting to redefine some of those assets, the definitions of them, to fit the Alaskan context. So self-esteem is one of the 40 assets. Um, and they're not all psychological, inter internal psychological factors. Some of them are uh, more than three adults other than the child's parent knowing them, caring about them, and the child you know, having those three adults, at least three adults in their life that they know care about them. Having a community where when people pass each other on the street, they actually look at children and smile instead of turn away are some of, some of the, the things that came out of their work. So it goes from individual psychological all the way to um, social and cultural features, although more social than cultural. Um, anyway, they did this and they, they tweaked some of those and, and in Alaska, for example, self-esteem in an Alaska Native community isn't how I feel about myself. It's how much I know about my culture and I'm connected to it and how much I know about my cultural literacy in terms of knowing about other Alaska Native cultures and feeling comfortable and competent to talk about and with people from those cultures. So very interesting changes to the assets. These became the basis. I wasn't testing the assets. I wasn't surveying for them. I simply wanted to use questions when I asked kids about their lives that had been determined by people here in Alaska to be relevant, to be relevant factors for them in terms of what constituted well-being, um, and to be asking questions that were also focused more on what might be going right than on what was going wrong. So. I, it was, this is a case study. I should have mentioned that right up front. So we're talking small numbers. This is an in-depth ethnographic study. Small numbers, lots of depth, lots of interaction with each participant over the course of a year. Um, 19 kids, about half and half, male and female. More older kids than younger. About two-thirds two were in that older um, group between the ages of 10 and 19. 53% um, of the kids described themselves as Russian Orthodox. 11% said they, they believed or, or felt connected to Alaska Native Dena and a spiritual tradition. Um, and 5% said they were connected to both. And then, of course, some said, I don't know, or nothing, um, or chose not to answer. Um, there's much more detailed information on all of these in the dissertation, of course, but essentially 71% of the parents of these children were residing in the village during the research. 24% were outside of the village, and 10%, or sorry, 5% of the parents were deceased. Okay, so to the findings. Um, and again, there's a lot more detail in the dissertation, and so I was sort of trying to figure out what to pick out and show you. Um, so I decided to really focus on, first of all, what did kids say about their well-being, and then what did we find out about subsistence, and then talk about how those two things intersect. So in terms of life satisfaction, this comes out of that survey, the multidimensional student life satisfaction survey that Hubner developed. Um, this, the <coughs> ratings were from uh, one to six. Children could, uh, there are a number of questions within each domain that get scored. Um, and I was looking specifically at these five domains, um, and I added in my interviews the sixth domain of culture, which is not included in, in Hubner's survey. So overall, that yellow, the line with the yellow writing, um, kids really have a really high level of, of life satisfaction. At least they were reporting a really high level of life satisfaction. That was really nice to see. Um, kids feel pretty good, actually, about how things are going overall in their lives, at least according to the Hubner survey. Um, but within that overall picture, there was a great deal of individual variability. So there were kids that were rating everything really well or most things really well. And, and then kids that you could see were really struggling in some domains. Um, in terms of what they talked about in the interviews, several themes really emerged as being key um, to <coughs> children's well-being. Family resilience was one and really had to do with um, kids talking about hard times that their families had been through, which might on the surface of it sound like um, not a positive thing. 
But ultimately, um, the kids who had higher reported levels of, of life satisfaction and personal well-being were kids who also were able to talk about how their families got through those hard times. And so they were able to talk about not just the hard times, but the resilience and that they had embodied through their experiences with their family. They talked about positive peer connect connections and moral support as being really important. The, the peer networks were so strong in the community um, and also were a really mixed bag because it was, a sm as most villages are, um, or many I should say, a very small community. This is a particularly small, small one. Um, and so the opportunity to make new friends was something that kids said they really wished they had more of. They really wanted to have more social connections and um, things like um, at that time MySpace was really, really big and Facebook was just kind of coming online. But MySpace and Facebook and I'm sure now that Selk, Selk phone coverage hit the community the year after I was there so I'm sure now there's lots of tweeting going on. Um, kids were reaching out to people all over the country and making connections with people not just around the country but around the world. Kids talked about friends in Germany and England and so it was really expanding their social horizons. Um, educational continuity. This is a community that some of you may be familiar with, um, the Chugach model, and the standards-based curriculum came in, um, I don't know exactly what year, it was around the time I went um, to live out there, so around 2003, um, and kids talked extensively, especially the older youths, talked a lot about their experience of how that transition occurred and essentially how they went to school one day and they were in a grade space system in their experience and, in the, and they went to school the next day and all of a sudden they had 350 standards to meet and they didn't know how to do it but they figured out how to do it and then two weeks later the school district decided that oh no that's too many we're going to cut them back we're going to change the curriculum again while they were working out these shifts and changes the kids were really essentially in the middle of an earthquake. I mean, the ground was really shifting under their feet educationally in a way that um, for one, one uh, person I remember very distinctly, but this was not a unique um, experience, talked about being a straight-A student. And um, she was, at the time I met her, 19 years old and trying to work on her GED had dropped out because it had become so frustrating that she was not meeting these, able to meet these standards and not knowing what the expectations or standards were that she was expected to meet. So that was a big deal in this particular community. It also, um, that combined with the No Child Left Behind um, fiasco, mm -hmm. if I'm allowed to call it that now, I think I am, um, was um, what had resulted in a loss of almost all of the school staff, um, of the principal, of teachers being moved to other um, districts in the other schools in the district, and and so it was a really dark time, really, in the in the school. And I, um, I get the sense from my communication with my my friends and the people that I stayed in touch with in Facebook, because I get to stay in touch with people on Facebook too. Um, I get the sense that things are shifting again and that things are getting more positive because you hear about more activities at the school, but like the parent support committee, I can't remember what they're called, but they're, you know, the group of parents that comes and makes sure that the school is doing what they want it to for the, I mean, they had just, everybody had dropped out of everything. Nothing, nothing positive was happening in the experience of either the parents or the children. And to be honest, even the teachers and the principal um, were really feeling pretty defeated. Um, Okay, so back to good things. Um, perceived well-being, other emergent themes, and this one was really one of the most interesting findings to me. Being helpful to others was really a defining feature of youth self-concept. So they talked about it being really important, I mean not in direct terms, but they talked about, they told stories that were about um, how good it made them feel to be helpful and useful to their elders, to other peers, to younger peers. Um, that was something they took a great deal of pride in, um, especially younger peers and their grandparents or their elders. And that was really interesting. Um, not surprising, especially, but interesting. And community sustainability, then again, people talked about the kids all said that, you know, yeah, of course I want to live here when I get older. Who wouldn't want to live here? It's gorgeous, it's wonderful, you know, we, ha we do great things, but. Then they also talked about the importance of the economy and how they weren't sure they could afford to live there as adults. 
and the social sustainability and the ways in which people had become less connected as a community and more isolated. Kids talked about, so, so that is the well-being data in a nutshell. I'm going to move on to the subsistence data. Um, among the 14, these are the 14 values that Athabascan values that um, kids rate, that the youths rated um, the importance of for themselves personally. There were 14 youths out of the 19 that took part in this. Since this happened over the course of the year, kids would kind of, you know, come into the study and then kind of, you know, fall back out and then come back in. And they got the choice. Um, it was all self-directed. They got to choose what they did and didn't participate in. There was not, I wasn't interested in, you know, holding anybody's, um, you know, foot to the fire and say, no, no, you said you were going to do this. So, you know, they did what they what they wanted to, as all research participants should, in my opinion. Um, so they um, ultimately all had pretty high, um, all the values got pretty high ratings, but certain values, of course, um, seemed to stand out at the top of that range, but really they, they were all rated as being pretty important. And then in the interviews, people talked about subsistence as sustaining life like the theorists had to have talked about physically, culturally, and personally. So these are pseudonyms, of course, but Marcus, who was 11 at the time, um, and just went to prom, which kind of blows me away, but said if you're trapped in the woods and you don't know how to make a fire or go after moose or anything, you'll die. And I heard lots of stories about, oh, when I got my first spruce grouse, or oh, I'm going to go after this tomorrow, and you know, kids were really proud um, of that. And not just boys, but mostly boys, but not just boys. Um, Albert, who was 19 at the time and is now a dad, um, which also blows me away, said, yeah, and how we live off the land is how it's important to me. So subsistence to him was about a way of living. It was about, a, it was about how, how people live, um, how they are as a people. And Natalie, um, who was 16 at the time, said, it means everything. It means everything to me. Um, and she spent many hours in my apartment telling she had, she was um, living. She was the only um, or one of the only youths in the village who was actually learning Dana Anna at home, um, and which is an incredibly difficult language to learn. And um, she would spend hours telling stories, traditional stories, to other kids. And they would try to participate, and she'd go, no, 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 that's not how it goes. This is how it goes. So she's really a culture bearer in her community, and I think will continue to be. Subsistence is a value, and this is, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I felt like I needed to at least give you some exposure to um, some of the more discrete um, data in terms of what kids said was important to them. I asked kids, what are your least favorite subsistence activities? What are your most favorite? What does your family do? What do you do every year? So that I could begin to look at where kids diverged or where they converged with their family's interests in subsistence. For example, grandparents talk about going to squirrel camp every fall when they were growing up. Kids think that eating squirrel is pretty gross and not something that you really need to do unless you're hungry, unless that's the only thing you have to do, and then it's just fine. But why would you do? You would only hunt squirrels for fun, you know, not for not for food at this point. Um, but subsistence fishing, which really is the sustaining, I mean, that has for centuries been what makes Lake Clark and Lake Iliamna country what it is. Um, Subsistence fishing was the most, and I'm sorry, I don't have the header here. These are the most favorite activities um, that when I ask kids, what are your most favorite subsistence activities? And this was free listing. There wasn't a discrete list that they could choose from. This was just a free list. Um, and I didn't, there was a lot of um, number, you know, one kid said X, Y, or Z, and there was a huge long list of that. I didn't include that here. So this is two or more kids talking about subsistence fishing, um, almost half of this small sample. Also swimming. This is a remember. This is lake country, and so the second the ice is like beginning to flow down the lake, they're jumping in, and they're they're ready to play. Um, and video games, which oftentimes in popular discourse in the media we hear conversation. Um, I just have to say this as a child and adolescent anthropologist of um, how video games are killing kids' interest in being outside. That is not true, I would argue for at least in this particular Alaska Native village. 
um, kids are doing both, and that is really my mantra um, when it comes to talking about a lot of these sort of polemic conversations that we have with each other or we hear in the media or in academic discourse about this or that. It's not, it's not this or that, it's both. And kids are really um, selectively choosing the best of both worlds when, or all worlds and figuring out how to merge them in this kind of cultural, syncretic, um, creative process, which is really fun to watch. So, um, In terms of what they're doing, 92% of the kids fish on an annual basis. I did include the specifics for fishing just so you could see some of the different types of fishing. 25% um, of them set net, 17% of them actually set net in the fall, so that's um, um, noodle by. I don't know if anybody has ever fished or knows about fishing for spawned out salmon, spawning salmon, but red salmon, um, and that's a delicacy that some families still do. And then 83% of the kids just said fishing. They didn't indicate more specifically what they were doing. 92% are gathering um, and 67% are hunting. So hunting's really gone down because in the last 10 years the caribou have really moved away from the village and so they're just, and the moose population isn't really very good there. So there's a lot less hunting than there used to be. It takes an enormous amount of cash resource um, for the gas and, and the Honda and the ammunition to get to where the animals are now. Um, use least favorite subsistence activities, interestingly, also fishing, <laughs> um, and hunting and trapping and gathering. So small sample. We can't tell a lot about what this means, but what it tells me is there's variation, um, and these are these are the key activities um, to be focused on. So barriers to use subsistence practice. Um, I left this in because one of my advisors really loved it because it's the Venn diagram circles. I thought it was kind of <laughs> cheesy, actually. Um, but she made me put it in the dissertation, so I figured I would trust her because she's a lot more experienced, successful researcher than I am at this point. Um, so. I wrote a little blurb in one of the fish and game technical reports a few years ago on children at fish camp. And essentially what I talked about in there is, is what's happening here is in that first top circle, that fish camp isn't the only camp in kids' lives now. There's Bible camp, there's science camp, there's um, culture camp. There's all kinds of camps that kids can attend, formal camps as well as um, less, you know, not they're not necessarily called camps, but there's a whole lot of things that kids can be participating in during the summer months when they're not in school. I'm not talking about during the school year when we know that they're, they're consumed, what, seven or eight hours a day, presumably with school. Um, so there's a lot of competing interests, and kids have to choose which of these opportunities do I want to learn from my grandparents, my parents, do I want to spend time at home and play at fish camp, which everybody talked about positively, to be honest with you. Nobody said... I take that back. One one youth said, nah, I don't really care for fish camp. Um, but for the most part, fish camp is really fun. Um, and so they're making these choices about, do I want to go learn science this summer? Do I want to go take part in this program where I get to meet kids from Southeast and I get to have a broader social network and I get to increase my career or my educational opportunities? Or do I go to fish camp? So there's a lot of competing interests going on. Um, I mentioned the scarcity of animals. I mentioned the need for cash, um, but also mentors. There are, um, you know, I think that for those of us that pay attention to these things and work in these areas and live in these areas of um, Alaska where we're aware of kind of that, you know, um, the issues that were created that Diane and Lexi have written about with Alaska boarding schools and, and other reasons why people, you know, whole generations of people had to leave. Um, and so there was a whole lot of um, intergenerational learning that got lost. And not the, not the, not the how do you do the, the, how do you put up fish at fish camp, but the how do you teach a younger generation, that kind of, that kind of learning that got lost. So kids really talked about needing mentors. There was a Dinna and a language teacher at the school one of the community members who volunteered to do that, which I find amazing. I mean, who, who volunteers day after day at a school um, to do something so hard? Um, she did until she got burnt out, and then she couldn't do it anymore, and then there was no more, no more dinner and a language learning. So 
Same thing happened with the dance group for a while. They're dancing again. They were here for the um, the big powwow a couple weeks ago, but you know, it's really it's not there's not a lot of continuity. Um, and again, that community, educational, and family continuity is another another barrier to practicing. So I feel like I've really skimmed the surface, but I've been talking for 45 minutes, and I want to leave time for folks to ask questions. Um, so essentially. This group of views have generally a pretty high, and I didn't even talk, I'm sorry about the aspirations, but I certainly can in the discussion um, answer questions, but they generally have really high perceived well-being, um, yet they are experiencing serious challenges to their present and future well-being in some life domains. They all, um, almost all, have really high aspirations to participate, or had, I should say, this was several years ago now, um, in subsistence activities as adults. Um, However, they also have aspirations to travel the world. They have aspirations to be underwater marine welders and educators and all sorts of other things. And so it will be interesting um, if I'm fortunate to continue my relationship with the community as I have to see where these, where these stories, um, unfold, how they unfold. Um, but several key points that I want to just mention that I take away from the information they shared with me. Activity and being helpful to others, these are central to Dena Enayu's positive self-concept. Um, doing versus being. It's not good enough to just be a good person. That doesn't really mean a whole lot. You are a good person because you are doing good. And you're doing good not just for yourself, but for other people. Healthy relationships and, and to peers and support of adults is really critical. It's not really unlike any other culture that I know. Communities like cultures are built by dedicated individuals and sustained and collaborative, if sometimes clumsy, effort. And so knowing that there is that network or that, that web of interaction and relationship is really important for kids to feel well and to be well. And experiential learning is much higher, more individually valued and culturally re resonant than standard book-based curricula. So, um, in conclusion, in inland Dena'ena country, and I suspect in other Alaska Native communities as well, subsistence and other cultural activities are in principle and in practice protective factors that promote youth well-being by fostering connectivity, continuity, and coherence to valued others in the past, present, and future. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm working on another project where I'm going to use it. Good. It fits in really well. I hope it comes well. I got to go. Sorry. We'll be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Bernie. Yeah. Do you guys mind if I just join you at the table? Is oh, that okay? Please do. <laughs> on a very personal level, and introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Becky. Hi, Becky. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, on, on a personal level, it's really cool, shall we say, <laughs> um, to see how you've taken, frankly, the assets framework and how you use that as uh, part of the foundation as well as the cultural values. And I was one of the people that worked on the book, Helping Kids Succeed. Oh, thank and so you. To, uh, to see it, you know, like when you're when you're a mom of something and you see how it comes to life. And yeah. Like, oh, look at this. Cool. Yeah. So oh, that, that was great. Thank My you. My question um, had to do with the cultural values. Mm -hmm. And you, um, uh, if I understood this right, you talk about well-being and then you talk about the cultural values. And did, did you do um, the, an analysis that showed or that looked at uh, among young people who had the cultural values that you pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, how that impacted their well-being? Mm -hmm. um, I did not, Becky. Okay. I had this, <laughs> like, I, would, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, like a lot of uh, pre-doctoral researchers, I <laughs> Bit off a really, really big chunk with this one. You know, I had these. I thought, oh no, I'm just going to look at the intersection of these three areas, and um, and I had an enormous amount of data at the end, um, and had been in this for uh, an embarrassingly long amount of time at that point. So, um, 
So I did not get to do everything with the data that I wanted to. It's something I would very much like to, to look at. Um, I'm not sure, though, with these data because, as you saw, I mean, there was it's, it's very small, and almost everybody and almost all of the kids in this study, I mean, rated almost every value really, really high. So there's just not a lot of variability there. And I think you'd really want to see more variability in how kids identified or related to those values. To, to then look at the interaction with you know their perceived well-being and, and see more dimension to that. Um, so I'm not sure that it would necessarily this is necessarily the right data set to do that, but I think it would be very interesting to look at in a larger sample with more variability and, and also in a cross-cultural sample. Um, and with urban, what I would really like to do is to do something similar to this with a group of urban youth. Well, I think there's probably an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, looking at a couple people. Yes. Here, just be very where exciting you are. efforts going on. Yeah. Great. I would, I would love that. I mean, I work for the yeah. regional tribal health organization now here in South Central, and you know. Um, a, with and there happens to be an unnamed program evaluator in the room who works there too. So I think it would be lovely to do that kind of work here in Anchorage um, in a way that served our um, our the population of people that we, that we serve. So I need you on a committee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> She's gonna owe me a lot of sushi. I, I, I owe her so much sushi. <laughs> culture committee that is really looking, well, we have to identify outcomes, that are community level outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, the goals for the group or around culture are that students know who they are and know their heritage. I can remember all of these. Yeah. I've only written them like five times this week. Um, <laughs> and I'm That's not probably why you blocked them out. <laughs> um, but so we, there are specific goals for yeah. the effort overall, but operationalizing those into outcomes, mm -hmm. knowing that there's probably no solid, you know, measurement. We'll have to go find that, and we'll have to build a baseline. Recognizing all that, we still need to identify some outcomes. And um, we we love your input and your colleagues' input if you wanted to join us. That sounds really actually interesting and exciting. So that maybe I'll owe Diane sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be curious about if your thoughts on the intersection of traditional and subsistence culture and the very modern culture of, of cell phones and social media and and uh, playing of video games. And this is Richard Webb. Oh, excuse me. Yes. And and he he's a technology and and gaming person who knows somebody oh. that you and I know in common too. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So the intersection, and is are you interested in a particular aspect of that? Richard, well, or? well, I mean, it, it's I see it as a, a very much a double-edged sword. I mean, obviously yeah. it has it has repercussions that can be very negative, mm -hmm. but I've also found that there are some very positive aspects, as you were talking about. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you discover others in the world who have the same uh, ideas, the same cultures, the same mm -hmm. thoughts, the same problems as you, mm -hmm. and you can reach out beyond mm -hmm. your your limited physical space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the creative capacity on the on one side of that sword is really enormous, and the opportunity for youth to um, to to express themselves, um, as you mentioned, and to make those social connections, which I increasingly think, and I'm pro I'm sure I'm biased as an anthropologist, but um, and and also as the children of psychologists, I should say that as a disclaimer. Um, I think I'm pretty biased to think that, but increasingly I think in the research that I do whether it's suicide prevention research or well-being research, that connectivity is really the essence of what we need to be healthy people. I mean, at, you know, we need food and water and we need clean air and we, you know, all that stuff. But, but at, at the base, in terms of what makes, what drives those things, connectivity is really key. So in that sense, I think these tools that you're describing, this modern technology, yes, they are double-edged swords, but so is a gun. And guns are what we use to get 
meat and fish hooks are what we, you know. So I mean, these are really, as an anthropologist, I look at these things as, as tools that can be used in ways that are appropriate and useful or not. Um, but I think that the potential benefit for use in the villages is huge and way, way outweighs the, the potential negative benefits if they are appropriately mitigated. Um, I think that kids naturally, no, I shouldn't say naturally. I think, <laughs> I think that kids, at least in any country, want to be outside. And so, you know, when that's the when that when there are good ways to do that, that's what they're gonna you know most kids most of the time are gonna gravitate to. But they also need the social connections and relationships and ways to express themselves and ways to explore and be creative. And I think that the web and all of these things that you know have come into play in the last 10, 15 years are are giving us all a way to do that. To be honest, it's not just the kids. It's just that they're at a particularly ripe developmental. You know, I mean, I would, I try to keep that alive in me. I, you know, in the 40s, I'm like, I want to, you know, be at a particularly ripe developmental. You know, adult development is important too, and we, we are creative in our older lives, but they're just, you know, there, there is that particular place in their life where they can make use of it. And I, I think two of the things going into the future. One is you, you talked about being outside. With the, the, the assumption being that you're indoors playing a video game. Well, mobile is, mm -hmm. is expanding it. Right. You know, exponential rates. I know. And I'm getting pictures from fish camp. Like I'm seeing fish on Facebook like exactly. minutes after they're caught, and I'm thinking, why am I here and not there? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the other thing, I mean, there are other ways in which, aside from the social aspects of this, I mean, the physical aspects. Like I remember reading, and I wish, I wish I had kept better notes, but I remember reading an ar article. Um, when I was in the field, Lord knows where I came across it, but it was an optometry article where they did a study of kids playing video games, and they were basically showing what they, their, I just remember their finding, I don't remember their methods, but they found that kids who play video games a lot have much um, more, more um, eye acuity, their, their ability to discern things in the environment, they can pick things out much faster, which made a lot of sense, I mean intuitively it makes sense, but and then I'm like sitting there in my little apartment with a window that overlooks some of that beautiful scenery. And I'm sitting there with a kid doing an interview one day and he was like, hey, did you see that wolf just go by on the other side of the lake? And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, that's like <laughs> way far away. How did you pick that out? And so I thought, hmm, this is interesting. I could see potential connections there too. How if kids are actually doing, you know, there could be some actual physical benefit in terms of the ability to sense things in the environment that are coming out of spending so much time, you know, it's, I mean, that's a lot of study of those screens that they're doing. And if that, they, they can then go outside and be more, you know, aware of the physical environment or if it en enhances the sensitivities they've already got because of spending time with their grandparents on the line, I could see some interesting intersections there. This is all just hypothetical. <coughs> Unfortunately, I have to go, but it, it, it would be okay. I, I, would like to continue this conversation. I have a one o'clock appointment, thank regrettably. You. Yes, and please. Thank you very much. I should have remembered to pull these out of my pocket earlier. There you oh, go. Wonderful. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, this was just in response to the technology question. I was in Bethel uh, last week, I guess, and I visited with uh, someone who's in the training program coordinator in Lotto. <coughs> just to share that Facebook is really a powerful tool. I mean, if it exists now, there's nothing we can do about that at this point. And so they, you know, they take pride in their youth group. They say, oh, they um, post on their Facebook, we're going snowshoeing. They take pictures of snowshoeing. They take pictures of the boots that they're making. And so it's a really powerful tool to express the culture and to take pride in that. And so uh, I think the, the more the better in that aspect, because it, it's really the way that life is going. If they can take pride in their cultural activities and share them in that way, because that's what kids love to do, then um, it's really pretty powerful. And it's provide a great network group. In addition to posting their images online, they provide advice to each other and remind each other about test dates and all those things. So it does it does create that connectivity, even if it's technology based. I agree wholeheartedly with you, and I think not just um, taking pride, but receiving pride, mm -hmm. um, prideful, you know, receiving positive feedback and feedback and just re being seen. Um, I mean, that thing that the Search Institute and the Alaska ICE talks about, you know, in their in the 40 developmental assets of, in how important it is for kids' well-being to be seen. 
And if you can't be seen in your own family or your own community, which I mean, I'm not saying that these kids weren't, they very much are very loved and adored um, and very integrated into their, their communities. But, but if you can't be seen there, if you don't have that and the benefit of that in your home, then these other ways of relating to people in the world and having people relate back to you are ways of being seen. And so I think that um, those, that positive self-concept that you're talking about is, is key in the internet and Facebook and all these things are, are a way for that to happen, potentially. Hi, Matt. Well, we are, do, okay, so one last question. Matt can be concise. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Difficult. <laughs> no, I, since, since your findings clearly show that there's not that much variation, that most, most of the other kids were involved, I was wondering about the one or two who weren't. And, and you know, obviously you're I am to, too. to what you can say about that because of privacy, but, right. but it seems to be in some ways, are these just individuals who fall through the crack, cracks or is this some, I guess the exception can actually help prove the rule. Right, so absolutely. So I'm wondering if you looked at those people in more detail. No, I couldn't. I mean, I would love to. Have, I would love to have looked, and I know, or asked questions. And can I interview you about why you don't want to be in my research study? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be awesome. Um, you know, but no. I mean, there were. I can tell you. I think there's a. It's not all one answer. It's a great question, though. I just want to say it's a great concise question because, and I had the same question myself, and to this day do. There were 75% of the eligible kids took part, and I didn't mention that, but I should have. So it was a pretty high participation rate. The few that didn't, um, I can only speculate about after being there for a year and seeing kind of them, inter you know, being able to observe them interacting with other people, certainly, and subbing in the school. Um, you know, I think it ranged from potentially personal traits like shyness um, to which happens um, even to the we extroverts sometimes and um, to things like um, relationships that we're all consuming <laughs> like you know uh, romantic relationships that I this is just not where I want to spend my time because <laughs> I'd really rather be hanging out with with my significant other um, I think that there may have been some um, families that maybe were more protective um, and and therefore kids also were being more protective of their families um, that's a possibility. But um, I mean, I certainly, I can tell you that of the kids that did participate, there were kids that were heavily involved in subsistence and kids that weren't. There were kids that came from, that were in families where there was lots, there were lots of social problems, active social problems going on, and there were kids in families where there weren't. I mean, I can tell you within the kids that did participate, there was a lot of variability, so. So I, I guess my, specifically, I was interested in that one thing I noticed in the community is there's uh, in religion, you have like half or more Russian Orthodox, and then you have a group of evangelical Christians, and then people who said they weren't religious, and that and I was just wondering if that was related at all to. No, the evangelical Christians in the community, for the most part, are not Dena Enna, and therefore were not eligible to take part in my study, which mm -hmm. was really convenient for me because <laughs> I was studying. I really wanted to know about for the Dena for Dena Enna use for Alaska Native youth. So they're not native. Most of the, uh, no, I mean, what I reported here is all from kids who are Alaska Native, but most of the, I mean, there's some missionization that has happened in the village, but it's been very resistant historically. I mean, there have been missionaries in that village in pretty much the same house um, <laughs> for literally decades. I mean, literally in the same house. There's a book written on it. Ar Ar Arctic Barnabas, I think, uh, wrote a book on it. And, you know, the two nuns, they're, they're not nuns, the two women, I don't know why I call them nuns, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the two missionary women who lived there in the 70s, 60s and 70s, I mean, they live in Wasilla now. I mean, it's like, it's been passed down from missionary to missionary over the years. And um, and there, like I said, there's been some missionization, and, you know, I well, see bits and pieces, but really, it is a very resist. It's except been, the Russian Orthodox mission that carries your success. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm not talking ago. about the Russians. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about the Russians. I'm talking about the Christian missionaries so the that came in and this. Yeah. It's very, well, it's very, very ground, ground, yeah. And, re and, and Linda Alana writes about this, how, you know, the Russian Orthodox missionization and the approach of the Russian Orthodox missionaries really, it was so different. It was really, it really it was able to be integrated into, and it really supported at the, uh, the Dena Ena worldview in a lot of ways. 
it of course shifted it and changed it too, or people used it to change their you know their worldview. But um, but it was a much more um, gentle mm -hmm. um, and integrative, more you know missionization than the the evangelical and and, and a lot and of the other. languages were developed by the Russian missionaries. Yeah. yeah, I mean it gave them vehicles for for in some ways that they didn't have before, and they saw that opportunity and they used it. So it was really quite crafty and quite um, smart in that sense that that communities were able to to use those resources to their advantage. Now I'm not saying it didn't come, you know, that there isn't more to be said about that, but um, but yeah, that's very different than the, the missionization happening today. And people are very, they're very respectful of the missionaries and the, the missionaries actually were my landlords and so I spent quite a bit of time with them. They were the ones with the resources to have apartments. Um, but I, um, yeah, I mean, it, they, they're valuable in other ways. They're valuable mechanics, they're valuable because they're good people who welcome children into their home and kids could go there at any time of the day and be safe and happy and they are great members of the community, but they are not converting a lot of people. Well, thank you very much. Thank and you people so are welcome much. to stay.